Hey everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're logging in from. This is JSA TV and JSA Podcasts, the newsroom for telecom and data center professionals. I'm Jamie Scott Okutaya, and on behalf of my team here at JSA, thank you for joining us during these very difficult times as we continue to face down COVID-19 with travel and work restrictions, on-site networking events have been put on hold for several months now, as we all know, which means that these JSA virtual roundtables really taking on a new level of relevancy as a timely platform where we can seek advice and information, even answers to our questions from top industry thought leaders as we face these latest challenges of today's new reality together as one network infrastructure community. Also, hopefully a little sunshine at your door today. We have provided lunch, or if you chose a gift card to a local restaurant for the first 100 registrants. So for those of you who have received the first 100 who registered, and we have over 200 registered, so that's only about half of you. Uh, but for the first 100, please go ahead and enjoy your JSA lunch while we get started here today. And a quick reminder, this is a roundtable, roundtable format. So we wanna hear from you. We wanna hear your voice. We wanna help answer your questions. So go ahead and type in any questions you may have for our panelists into that question box. And depending on time, we'll get to as many as possible. And additionally, the last 15 minutes of the hour, we're gonna take our conversation over to LinkedIn for a chat with many of our speakers here today, all of our speakers. Uh, so go ahead and go to LinkedIn we will put the direct link right there in the uh, chat box for you shortly. Um, you can also search on hashtag JSA virtual roundtables. It's with an S at the end. Um, and our feed will come up as well. Uh, so make sure you also carry over the conversation and post your questions and thoughts for panelists on LinkedIn too. All right, so getting started here. This is JSA's fourth roundtable in a series of necessary conversations right now on the impact of COVID-19 to both our industry and our target verticals. Next one up, coming in about three weeks from now, is COVID-19 and its impact on educational networks. So that's May 28th, 1 p.m. Eastern, with guest moderator and my friend, Mr. Rob Powell of Telecom Ramblings. Please check it out, jsa.net. Register and let us know if you have any additional speaker suggestions. Uh, this is, again, a platform for all of us, so we want to hear from you. All right, let's get started. Two days topic, COVID-19 and its impact on healthcare networks. Very timely. And to underscore the importance of this conversation today, we have over 200 registrants joining us. Thank you, community, for your continued support of this series. We just announced this topic, you know, three weeks ago, uh, and we already have such a great, great number of registrants. And our all-star executives within days dedicating their time for us today. We thank you panelists for joining us. And to help us introduce them and to guest moderate, please welcome our own fabulous JSA director, my colleague, a gentleman I learn from every day. He also heads our, our strategic industry writing team, Paul Sketchley. He's one of our industry's top content writers on healthcare networks. We're really excited to have Carl as our moderator today. Carl, thank you and the floor is yours, my friend. Thanks very much, Jamie. Um, and thank you to our viewers for tuning in and to all our panelists for taking the time to join us for a very timely topic, the impact of COVID-19 on healthcare networks. Um, of course, we know that the healthcare sector is such a vital one for each and every one of us. Um, throughout this pandemic, healthcare workers have continuously displayed much heroism going into risky environments to take the best care possible for those affected by the novel coronavirus. Um, so I think, you know, we'd all like to open this round table with a collective and heartfelt gratitude for, for all that they're doing. And, you know, we wish them much luck and health as they continue to um, fight this virus. And hopefully, you know, one day soon, it will be in the rear view mirror. At the same time, though, I think we'd all likely agree that our own tech and telecom sector right now is quite vital for the IT side of healthcare, supporting their networks in extremely critical ways. Um, so just before we dive into our discussion, I'd like to start by going around the virtual table. Um, we have with us today four very distinguished individuals. 
Um, so I'd like them to tell us a bit about who they are and um, their companies and what their companies specialize in. So in a few sentences, Annalie, uh, let's start with you. Sure, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Annalie Ilg. I'm the CISO at Envolta. Uh, Envolta is a national managed service provider. We specialize <clears throat> in co-location, hybrid cloud, uh, managed IT, consulting, and security services. Excellent, thank you. Eric, how about you? Good afternoon, everyone. Eric Dahl, Vice President of Business Development for Strategic Venue Partners, better known as SVP. And we offer wireless infrastructure as a service or the fourth utility that can make, be made up of DAS, Wi-Fi, public safety systems, IPTV, fiber, and CBRS on go private LTE networks. You know, we manage the entire development process from initial design to system commissioning to monitoring and maintaining it 24-7, 365 days a year. We bring a complete long-term technology solution, including multiple ongoing system refreshes and upgrades. And we fund 100% of the distributed network system, no carrier needed or requiring um, ensuing certainty for system delivery day one. Along with the venue, uh, we bring all major carriers to the system day one, and we bring back revenue to the, the, the venue if possible at 90% of carrier rents or capital contributions. We look forward to the discussion today. Excellent, Eric. Thank you. Mark, how about you? Hello, everyone, and thanks for having me on the panel. Pleasure to be here. My name is Mark McNeil. I lead the healthcare practice here at uh, Tech Guidance in the Chicago area. Um, we provide um, consulting services around communication, collaboration, and technology in healthcare to our clients. Our services are actually free. What we try to do is foster connections between our clients and suppliers who offer services that can meet those needs. Amazing, thank you. Ryan, let's, let's hear about you. Great, thank you so much. And Jamie and Carl, thanks for putting this together. Uh, this is really fantastic. And thank you for everybody who's joining today. Uh, Ryan Barbera, I'm with uh, Data Canopy. I'm the CEO here. Uh, Data Canopy is an infrastructure as a service provider, an IaaS provider. Uh, we have 16 locations around the US and several locations in Asia. Uh, we like to say that if it's regulated or complicated, we work on it. So we provide everything from uh, simple co-location all the way up into uh, hyperscale workload management and everything in between, uh, which is just a little bit of stuff. So, um, you know, we really uh, focus very heavily on the healthcare industry as well as in the federal space, which are both converging uh, in general, but today a lot. And I'm really excited about the conversation today. So thank you guys for uh, for having me as a guest. I appreciate it. Excellent. Thank you all so much for that wonderful explanation. Um, okay, well, let's hop right into it. We have to start with a very um, short and punchy question. So COVID-19, what are the top two challenges healthcare networks are facing as a result of this pandemic? Um, Anna Lee, tell us what you're seeing out there. Sure, so of course it depends on the level of preparedness. Um, the two that come to mind are really just the available bandwidth, um, any kind of urgent routing and architecture changes um, to meet the demands of accessing critical systems from a dispersed workforce. Um, in most cases, capability requirements have changed, resulting in maybe possible unplanned equipment replacements and uh, increase in capabilities. Excellent, excellent answer. Eric, how about you? What are you seeing? Yeah, I think one of the most the things I'm hearing from the customers I'm talking with on a daily basis are reliable, up-to-date network infrastructure and new technologies on that uh, network infrastructure. Collaboration tools that are enabling their workforce that isn't critical at the uh, site to be remotely uh, engaged, as well as clinical application environments that allow the support rapidly changing needs along with that new mobility <laughs> intent clinical scenarios. And if you've heard many hospitals using, you know, iPads, bring your own devices, and that obviously brings a whole host of, you know, you think it'd be a simple solution, but there's a very significant impact both in from an IT budget setup, not to mention the strain on the mobility cellular bandwidth and the capacity of network infrastructure as well, but it does affect and improve the patient experience. Uh, so those are the things I'm hearing from customers I'm talking with on a daily basis. Right. Thank you. 
Mark, what are you, what's the sense you're getting out there from the industry? Uh, some similar things. Certainly the um, supporting the expansion of uh, remote care is uh, probably the top challenge that we hear about. That would include not only the uh, pop-up testing facilities and remote clinics, but also uh, telemedicine as well. And, and obviously all three of those areas are, are a prime focus right now and growing very rapidly. Um, in addition to that, so that would, that would play back into what Annalie and Eric were saying about infrastructure and bandwidth so that you know, we can access systems from those remote locations. It's not only the patients who are remote, many of the caregivers are now remote as well. So they're no longer within the full vault of the hospital. Uh, so managing those interactions and making sure that they have the access to critical systems that they require are, is certainly a top challenge. Uh, a close second behind that is, okay, now that we are remote, we've got our networks uh, extended probably further than we ever thought we would. Uh, how do we maintain security? I mean, obviously, this is an industry that deals with extremely sensitive information. It is highly regulated. Uh, how do we protect patient privacy? How do we uh, prevent the sharing, accidental sharing of PHI, uh, you know, when we needed to actually protect that information? So those are the two key areas that that we hear from a, a lot of our clients and how can we help them address those issues, which we'll discuss here today. Excellent, absolutely. We're totally going to come back to those wonderful topics. Uh, Ryan, uh, as a member of Data Canopy, um, what, is, what is your organization seeing uh, from healthcare networks and, and healthcare providers? Yeah, thank you. Um, so we see, uh, so everything that, that the, um, the other panelists have talked about, we certainly see some parts of that, but we see it a little bit differently because of just where we sit in the stack as an infrastructure provider. Um, we actually see um, a lot of the issues in and around interoperability between disparate systems. Right now, there's a huge demand for information share. Some of the other panelists talked about the difficulties in that just in a, in a in a, in a general sense, that's always difficult. But now as things need to happen in almost near real time, that's become more and more difficult. Um, you know, these disparate systems were uh, designed for single providers. And so now they're trying to extract data, share data, leverage data in ways that's never been done before. And, and that can prove to be really difficult. Um, secondarily, I think, and, and this is actually something I think everybody's talking about, in addition to the security, um, infrastructure, in many cases is outdated um, or just not robust enough to handle what's going on in the current environment. And I think that's whether it's telemedicine or again, whether that's storage, whether it's compute, whether uh, it's bandwidth, whatever the case might be, uh, right now you're hearing just more, more, more. I mean, that is kind of the thing that we're hearing all the time. Um, then you combine that with the regulatory compliances that haven't gone away. So you still have your HIPAA, your HIPAA high tech, uh, you know, all of the other compliances that are around that and protecting the data. Um, it's incredibly complex. And then we have to also remember that the point here is to actually help people. So, you know, it's the balance of how are we improving these networks? How are we making this data available? And at the same time, um, you know, ensuring that um, the healthcare professionals and the patients are, are being handled well also. So those, those are the big issues that we're seeing today. Absolutely, Ryan. And, you know, I think that's actually a phenomenon that's occurring around the world uh, right now. I, I think yesterday I saw an article, for example, um, in the news that talked about Japanese physicians that were um, protesting basically their working conditions, not so much from a health perspective, but from a technology perspective. Uh, we have, you know, seen the stories of young doctors um, that are still using fax machines to attempt to you know, transport vital information uh, to each other and, and between their patients. And it's, um, you know, they're just saying <laughs> now is the time we really need to get ahead of this because it's a, it's a huge hamper on our efforts. So um, excellent point. And also what an interesting way to segment into another um, salient topic right now, which is telemedicine. Uh, so, you know, right now we see a lot of comments about telemedicine as a great way to take care of, you know, ongoing or non-critical health issues without having to go to healthcare facilities. Um, but, you know, there are still challenges around that. 
Um, so what needs to happen, in your opinion, what needs to happen to healthcare networks in order to make the widespread use of telemedicine, you know, a realistic long-term possibility? Uh, Annalie, what do you think? Sure. So, um, you know, I think telemedicine is really one of those projects that were in the plan or are being planned for versus using in the immediate. You know, it's kind of one of those roadmap items where you're like, hey, we'd like to utilize telemedicine more or a portion of it. Uh, when COVID came into play, everybody kind of, they had to hurry up to make this happen, um, which is amazing in itself. But however, when we're not really putting the time to plan, um, you know, it creates, well, some of these telemedicine uh, platforms are a bit clunky, right? Or not everybody knows knows how to use them. So like with any change, um, the network capabilities should be evaluated. Um, you need a robust platform. And this platform must be able to connect to all the critical systems to pull and share data. Um, really, it needs to support a scalable experience that supports streaming. Um, so with that said, you know, I believe that, uh, you know, there needs to be an architecture redesign. Security uh, measures need to be in place, um, such as, I'll just to name a few, DDoS protection, IDPS, uh, data loss protection. And, you know, right now, one of the challenges, too, is that attacks have risen. So security attacks have risen um, since the work from home mandate. Um, so just a couple of thoughts to think to think about there. Absolutely. Eric, from your from strategic venue partners perspective, um, what do you think about the telemedicine issue? Yeah, I think the interesting thing about telemedicine is that, you know, it comes back to the initial question. It's, we need an updated 5G network infrastructure, but it's both in the care settings, meaning the hospitals, the medical office buildings, the ambulatory surgery centers, long term care facilities, as well as in the patient's homes, whether that be in an urban or rural setting where it's, you know, bleak at best. Uh, you know, I believe that there's going to be a need to accelerate that virtualization of some of the patient provider encounters that you know, we've all become accustomed to in telehealth or telemedicine and remote monitoring, AI supplementation, diagnostics, and then technology uh, enabled, uh, you know, healthy at home, for example, all are variants that we're going to have to see that uh, to come to light with this. And CMS and the reimbursement, rule, reimbursement rules are going to have to be vigorously considered. You know, they've done it temporarily during the COVID process, but I did see a, a pretty interesting quote this week by uh, uh, the CMS administrator, Seema Verma, and she said, uh, I think the genie's out of the bottle on this one. Uh, I think that it's fair to say that the advent of telehealth has been just completely accelerated and it's taken this crisis to push us to a new frontier, but there's absolutely no going back, which is great from an infrastructure company standpoint, such as SVP. We look forward to working with the health systems in order to make them up to date in order to be able to provide that service. Absolutely. Mark, you look like you uh, had a nod of agreement there or something to add. Yeah, no, I, 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 I love Eric's comment and, and sharing that quote makes sense. I and mean, certainly COVID-19 has catapulted telemedicine to the forefront. It was probably in most healthcare providers' top five initiatives, but most of them now are looking at it as number one. And I think Annalie also said, you know, the issue that we have is that not everyone is at the same level, unfortunately, and, and bringing some of the laggards up to where they need to be is, is an issue. I, one thing I do want to say is that the other thing that COVID-19 has done um, is gotten the healthcare industry through what I think is a major hurdle, which is patient acceptance. Um, this was not really the fundamental way that people wanted their health care. They wanted to go for an office visit for the most part talk to their physician face to face, they are now much more accepting of this virtual care or remote situation, at least in certain circumstances. So that's a major hurdle to get through. I mean, I think Ryan mentioned it earlier, we're talking technology here, but this is all about people in the end. So if the people don't want the experience and, and don't accept it, you know, the technology that we put in place really doesn't matter. Um, so that's a that's a huge hurdle that we've gotten through, I think, and and certainly we can take some steps here in our industries to kind of move telemedicine forward and help uh, bolster that acceptance and make it more, more widespread. And I think we've talked 
talked about some of those things. Certainly, you know, the scaling of infrastructure and bandwidth so that we all have access to information and communications. We can support the collaboration solutions that, that we need. Um, cloud is certainly going to help us in a lot of those areas. A lot of the customers that we deal with are running telemedicine operations out of a contact center. So, you know, in order to scale that quickly, you know, uh, CCAS solutions are, are critical. Collaboration in the cloud solutions are critical. Even infrastructure in the cloud is now um, uh, available where it gives healthcare providers the ability who may have not prepared for these things to rapidly scale up infrastructure and capacity in their network to start handling, you know, telemedicine kinds of situations. Excellent points too. Uh, Ryan, what are, what are you seeing from Data Canopy? Uh, Mark just mentioned scalability, cloud, infrastructure. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I really honestly, um, it's kind of bad to go last because I get to hear everybody else say all the things I was going to say. But uh, <laughs> but no, but they're 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 all um, they're all 100% correct. Uh, Mark um, uh, is absolutely right in terms of the scalability. It's a little bit what we talked about in the first question in terms of how are we scaling these systems to meet the demand? Um, I think that everybody's dead on that COVID has taken what was kind of a slow roll in terms of how things were happening in telemedicine and basically made it mandatory, right? I mean, if you have a non-essential thing, you're going to be talking right now to your doctor, most likely um, by a telemedicine. Um, the other thing that Mark said that I do really want to kind of emphasize, not just on this question, but throughout the the entire discussion is that this really, uh, healthcare really is about people. And I think as technologists, it's really important for us to remember that. Um, you know, uh, my wife and I this week had a call with uh, my son's ENT doctor. He has tubes in his ears. We were scheduled to have those tubes removed. Obviously, there's no elective stuff or non-essential stuff right now. Um, so we had this online thing with him. Um, couldn't get his camera to work. Um, it was a little bit choppy. It was a little bit difficult for us. We couldn't see any of the diagrams he was showing about what the ear looked like. Um, and uh, at the end, I asked him, I said, you know, I know who we are and I know who you are, but there was a third box that was on the screen that we didn't know who that person was. And it turned out it was just that, you know, the doctor scribe, which if I'd been in the office, to Mark's point, uh, he would have introduced him and we would have understood who that person was. So I think that in addition to um, the technology, the human education portion of this, I mean, we're all people who live in technology, but I would just imagine what my, my grandparents would have, how they would have handled something like that or how they're going to do that. It's not just about, um, you know, people who know how to use technology, but if telemedicine is really going to be something that's effective in a pandemic or more broadly, like we're talking about. Um, the human element is the most critical element. So the technology has to be scalable, um, but we also have as technologists to be able to help our clients in using that technology in a way that's beneficial for healthcare workers and for patients as well. Absolutely. I mean, that is such a, such a very astute point. And, you know, I really think it gets at um, the theme around security, which we kind of touched on lightly already in this discussion, but we haven't really had a chance to get um, really down into it. But, you know, when, when you look at how COVID-19 has affected healthcare networks over the past six to eight weeks, um, you know, we really see that a lot of healthcare providers have had to extend their networks uh, as they set up multiple locations, including testing facilities and pop-up clinics. And, you know, so we've kind of talked a little bit about the challenges that this poses for their networks from a service delivery and security perspective, but, you know, what, what sort of things can they do or should keep in mind, you know, in order to safeguard their networks and, um, you know, solve some of those challenges. Um, so, Anna Lee, why don't we go around again with you? Sure. Um, first, I love Ryan's story. So Ryan, I'm gonna reference you so you don't feel like you're the last one on the list here. Um, but uh, I, you know, I, that story kind of really brings it to life because you know I can't imagine what healthcare providers are going through right now and have full respect. Um, you know, when I think about these situations, I think about how we need to make sure that these new facilities or these pop-up locations really feel like they're on site, right? It can't take five minutes 
or even three minutes, right, to pull up a patient record. Um, and when I think about that, I think about some of the challenges, and we've already talked about connectivity capabilities, but um, further securing wireless, uh, the security and capabilities of the IoT devices, right, that all healthcare providers utilize. Um, when I think of the data, I think of to make sure that we are continuing the encryption method, methods used for data transfer. Um, and really, from a security perspective, we're increasing the security footprint. And, you know, given rapid changes like this, um, I always caution um, some of the reality, which is capability and availability are always ahead of security. Um, so just make sure that when these changes are happening uh, on the network that we're reviewing configuration changes uh, and that we're ensuring the network is being monitored uh, by security tools. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, Eric, from Strategic Venue Partners perspective again, um, how, are you, how, how do you think healthcare networks can go around about solving their security uh, challenges or obstacles, whatever they're facing? Sure. And to keep in the personal light, uh, I just got married this weekend and my bride, now wife, is a COO and a CNO of a North Carolina healthcare system, and I live with that healthcare worker coming in the door every day after a very stressful and uh, crazy a day that she describes to me when I look at her calendar when she leaves in the morning. Sometimes she doesn't come home. Uh, they have a command, it's the command center that they have to staff 24 hours a day, and you want to talk about security and just, uh, you know, healthcare worker burnout. Um, I think the scary thing about it all is that, you know, 25% of all data breaches that are happening now are in the healthcare environment, so a quarter of those. The other staggering statistic is that 25 million patient records uh, in 2019 were uh, breached. And in fact, 53% of those originated within the establishment itself. So it's, it, it's something that from an infrastructure provider such as SVP, we want to put in the most secure, the most uh, highly uh, uh, technologically savvy network and we go with private LTE and or uh, carrier grade uh, signals. We can put in Wi-Fi, but as we all know, Wi-Fi has its, has its data issues. Uh, so we prefer the private LTE and or the carrier signal, uh, the LTE signal, and therefore to secure the networks. Interesting, thank you. Mark, uh, when you're advising your clients um, and when your firm does that, what sort of advice do you give them? Um, and interested in your thoughts here. So the first thing that we have to realize in face facts is that the, the person on the other end, the healthcare IT person, they are really comfortable within the four walls of the hospital, okay? They, they, they deal in an environment with highly sensitive information in a highly regulated industry. So when we start going outside of the firewall with these remote locations, there's a lot of sensitivity there. So um, heard what uh, the other panelists have talked about. We are facing similar kinds of things. And just to tell you one horror story from a major healthcare provider that, that came to us asking for advice, when they started doing their pop-up clinics, people were asking them, their caregivers were asking, so how do, we, how do we access networks? How do we get back to our apps? And how do we pull up patient records and everything like that? Somebody actually said to them, well, you're in a parking lot in a shopping center. You know, there must be a Starbucks there. Why don't you just link into their public Wi-Fi and do it that way? No word of a lie, actually somebody said that. So when, you, when you're thinking about that, and I know everyone on the panel here has a look of horror on their faces, but it actually does happen because people were forced into doing this so quickly that they could not back up things with the proper security. So now when we, when we hear about those horror stories, we check on that immediately, like let's make sure how you're connecting into your networks and your applications. Because certainly those kinds of things open up all kinds of potential phishing expeditions and other kinds of security things that you really don't want to face and deal with. Um, so uh, similar to what Eric is saying, we, we, are, we are coaching people more into 5G mobility, uh, secure LTE. Um, there are some people that have come to us interested in WiMAX. So we're looking at a lot of those different kinds of solutions, but certainly trying to coach people away from the quick fix of, you know, logging into the public Wi-Fi at Starbucks. That's certainly not the way to go. 
Wow, what, <laughs> what a story that is. Um, Ryan, you, you mentioned a while back that you, you, your firm does a lot of work too around um, HIPAA and the like. Um, what are your thoughts then on, on this um, topic of security? Yeah, I, I, um, I think that one of the last things Mark said there was um, this isn't fast. And um, the problem is, is that we have an immediate demand and need for expanded networks, expanded resources today. Um, and a lot of these orders don't have the human capital or intelligence, not, not because they're dumb, but because literally it's just not something that they've looked at. As Mark was saying, they've been highly concerned about the four walls of their, their, uh, their organization. So what the conversations that we're having with people are, you know, speed kills, uh, be quick, but don't rush. We have to take a look at all of these things. I think Eric was, Speaking to the idea of, you know, multiple devices, leveraging wireless. Um, Annalie was speaking to the idea of a CISO. Th these are not all mutually exclusive silos. All of this in our mind comes together. And if you don't have somebody who's focused on that or understands it, um, you're going to make mistakes. Most security breaches don't come from the network. Uh, you know, statistically, about 20% of breaches come from uh, external 80% of breaches come from internal problems that we're having. Somebody going to Starbucks and uploading patient files or something mm -hmm. like that. So, right. you know, if you're, if you're rushing and you're trying to just get something out there to check a box, you are invariably going to make a mistake and it can be very costly. You can expose people's data. Uh, you can cause access to systems you don't want people to have. So, Unfortunately, um, it's not an easy answer. I don't think that a lot of things are, and COVID is pushing a lot of organizations to try to get things done as quickly as they can. We always caution you have to just go at the pace that you can go at. Um, also, uh, and this is just the, the reality of it, most of this stuff is not super cheap. I mean, you have to be willing to spend the dollars to secure the infrastructure the way it needs to be properly secured. Um, you know, nobody wants to to be the lab or testing facility that accidentally had all of the tests for 10,000 patients, you know, exposed to the internet, right? So, um, so unfortunately, this one, this one of all the questions that you were asking for me was the most dangerous in terms of kind of the bad news scenario here is that um, security is really tough in normal circumstances, and when you're trying to go really fast and really hard, it's almost impossible, and so. Um, as people are expanding these networks, it's going to be incumbent to find really great partners and vendors that can help you do those evaluations and make the right decisions in terms of how to secure your network properly at every single level, including, again, at the human level, because um, that's where most of the breakdowns will happen. Right, Ryan. And, and you know, I, I think that really leads us into um, the question of, of the role of data center providers then in all of this, because you know, ever since um, the economic effects, uh, the, the rise in remote work, the surge in bandwidth demands came about due to obviously the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, I think we've seen that data center providers have played a very strong role in, in supporting normal operations, keeping businesses up and running and other crucial mission critical aspects. Um, but now, you know, obviously, you know, there is an argument that COVID-19 has accelerated the use of, of, of various e-health applications. Uh, you know, and, and we see now hospitals especially are generating vast amounts of extremely sensitive data that gets shared internally, you know, between staff, applicable patients. And then we have the whole mobile IoT devices, smart beds, tablets, sensors. So, you know, in your opinion, Ryan, you know, what, what is the role here for data center providers in, in supporting healthcare uh, providers through COVID-19, but not just through COVID-19, also beyond, um, you know, is this trend here to stay? And if so, you know, how can data center providers really carve themselves out a, a supportive role for this? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I just want to start by saying that data center providers are by far the most important of anything we've thought. No, I'm kidding. But, uh, you know, it's, um, it's, it's a great question. And, um, I, I think that, um, you know, data centers are somewhat ubiquitous now. We've always 
data centers have been around since the beginning, right? We just don't think a lot about them because we think of them as, um, you know, these weird warehouses where weird people like me scurry around and program things. And um, the reality is that um, data centers are the backbone of everything that's going on now. I mean, we are talking about, um, you know, I always like when people talk about wireless because there really is no such thing as wireless. It's just how your wireless device is connecting back to the wired infrastructure. Uh, that infrastructure terminates at a couple of key points around the country and around the world. Those are data centers. How you're accessing, we talked about CMS on this call. Uh, this is public knowledge, so I can talk about it, but Data Canopy is one of the host partners for CMS. If you're involved with Medicare today, you're touching a data center somewhere to get that information. Um, if you're talking to Amazon GovCloud, if you're talking to Azure, it doesn't matter. The data centers um, today live as that hub, and as these systems scale up, the data center will go uh, from being important to critical because really data centers are the only thing in the market in my mind that has the capacity to scale as quickly as is necessary, whether that's from a standpoint of uh, bandwidth capacity, whether that's from a standpoint of real estate, location, uh, whatever that might be. Um, you know, the idea that you could replicate what's being built in places like Ashburn, Virginia, or Dallas, or Shanghai, or Frankfurt, you know, these are pops that millions and millions and millions of people on a daily basis are reaching, and that lends themselves to being able to um, to help with this problem. So as we start to see more IoT, you know, the BYOD type of stuff, as we start to do more security, it's going to make data centers absolutely more critical. But to Mark's earlier point, it is shifting away from the traditional environments that we've seen and more into how are we leveraging cloud infrastructure and doing that in a way that allows us to scale effectively. So, you know, in my mind, and I am very biased, I always like to say that, but in my mind, uh, data centers are absolutely critical. Um, they were critical. They were important before. They're critical now. And to the point that you are making, all of our clients are seeing that expansion today in the healthcare space. We're having conversations with all of them about how to do that effectively. Right, right. So I can definitely tell the passion in that answer. Um, I'm actually interested, I think, for our audience too, to hear Eric's um, take on that because Eric, I think, you know, your firm does a lot in terms of the whole wireless uh, arena. So what, what is your um, response then to Ryan? Yeah, you know, I couldn't agree more with Ryan that, you know, wireless devices do connect to a wired world. And I look at it as, you know, how will 5G affect healthcare? That's how I look at it. You know, here are top six to start. Telehealth, telemedicine, remote patient monitoring, augmented and virtual reality, data analytics, decentralization of the healthcare model, you know, moving that care closer to the patient. We're seeing that already happen. And I think that's, you know, we talked about how that's been accelerated with the COVID-19. And I think, you know, large file transfers, you know, being between the OR and, and, and X-ray and what have you, you know, how does healthcare prepare for 5G? I think you've got to look for opportunities in your organization for enhancing patient care and improving operations that would benefit from the infrastructure. You've got to identify key players and departments that would participate in the initial project and how they would collaborate to provide efficiencies and integration. And then find a partner who can lead the way to 5G with no CapEx outlay, but only have a monthly managed service model like Strategic Penny Partners or SVP. And we bring a complete long-term solution, including multiple ongoing system refreshes and upgrades. So uh, that's how I look at it uh, from a, how are we going to bring 5G and how are we going to move healthcare into, into the next century, basically. Interesting. Yes, thank you so much for that. Um, all right, so to our panelists then, one, uh, one some summary question basically to so to sum up in one or two sentences what lessons will the healthcare industry specifically its technology administrators take from this COVID crisis that will help them prepare better for the future uh, so let's just go around the table uh Annalie what do you think sure so um you know having gone through many DR scenarios over the last I don't know 14 15 years um, it kind of goes back to I don't think anybody was really fully ready for this kind of impact. And when I say this kind of impact, the duration of impact, the financial impact. You know, the crisis, a crisis like, like this has impacted the financial 
um, considerations of the healthcare industry right now. And I think, one, it's very important to really think about the solutioning. Um, you know, also, I, another thing is I hope to see more funding, right? Um, more investment on the technology side, more openness to consider new technologies. Um, Eric brought up a lot of great ideas uh, around 5G, right? Um, and I think that that's really important to start looking at, again, new technologies and solutions um, for future crisis like this. Excellent. Mark, what do you think? So, uh, yeah, it, just, just to summarize, I mean, certainly remote care is, is here to stay. Obviously, COVID-19 has really catapulted that, as we've all said, throughout this entire discussion. But one thing I, I want to focus on that, that I'm hearing from some healthcare providers and also things that we're trying to generate here at, at Tech Guidance is um, I'm, I'm really predicting the rise of analytics and, and specifically communications analytics. As this trend to remote care continues on, and COVID-19 obviously gave it a huge push, as this continues moving forward and more and more healthcare interactions become virtual as opposed to being in the office. They're all leveraging some kind of communications platform, a collaboration tool, a wireless, uh, they're, they're texting, they're chatting, whatever it may be. Um, those platforms are generating valuable data that healthcare providers are starting to use. And I think some of the providers on the leading edge are really taking advantage of these communications analytics and looking at things um, like, you know, how long are these interactions lasting? How many contacts are we making to a particular patient before we have a positive outcome, et cetera? And some of the really um, uh, uh, sophisticated ones are, are really trying to develop from this data, uh, you know, what are the optimal contact kinds of strategies that we have for individual patient groups? Um, you know, when, when you look at, you know, uh, a post-surgical outpatient, you know, there, there's a whole bunch of contact that's going on there around, you know, the wound. I mean, are you in pain? Is there redness around the wound? Are you taking your prescription? Have you uh, scheduled your follow-up appointment, et cetera, et cetera? And some of the, as I said, some of the really sophisticated providers are leveraging telemedicine now and the data that they can extract from that to improve patient outcomes, um, to reduce readmission rates, and to come uh, basically back to offering better health care virtually because of all this extra data that they now have, recorded conversations where they're doing, you know, word spotting to figure out, well, what are the key topics and key questions that uh, patients are asking, how do we better prepare our caregivers to address those questions, et cetera. So it's giving them a lot of ammunition to kind of offer better health care in general. Thank you, Mark. Um, quick 30 seconds from Ryan and then Eric. What do you, what's your final thoughts? Um, I, I, I think that somebody touched on it earlier. Um, I like to think of this as a way for people to break out of the four walls of their office. And um, I think that healthcare has historically seen itself as a silo all the way from the um, the practice type to the doctor's office and, and north from there. And I think what this is teaching us is that um, by leveraging IoT, by leveraging big data, by leveraging analytics, we can do things in uh, that we could never do before, whether that's contact tracing, whether that's telemedicine, whatever it might be that's coming out of this. For me, the one silver lining of all of this is that I think it really has catapulted the idea that technology can help to make people's lives better in health. And um, we talk a lot about that, but it's been slow in adoption. And I think that this is going to force from the government down to the individual doctor to take a look at how we're using technology to make people's lives better. And um, that's my hope for this. And, and I, I think we're starting to see that. And um, I hope it's not a blip, but rather a trend, and, and that's, that's really what I would love to see come from, from this. Excellent. Thank you, Ryan. Eric, last comment. Yeah, I think yeah, the pandemic has resulted in really a shift in IT strategy. You know, better prioritization and focus on mission-critical projects only, and the need to accelerate 5G mobility network infrastructure and telehealth remote patient interactions are really at the top of their list. And, you know, there's cost improvements, hybrid uh, outsourcing, more managed services, and a really a long-term focus on uh, their their 
their networks and how they interact with the patient and their operational side of the business is key. Excellent. Thank you so much. And, and Carl, I'll, I'll take Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Um, and we have been watching the question box uh, explode. I want to also thank um, Alan Katz, Hassan Alas, some of our other viewers who have had some great questions coming in. Uh, our panelists have uh, done a great job of just naturally answering a lot of them. We we're talking remote workers and technology like AI and, and um, et cetera. And I think you guys really did a, a good job of, of responding. Um, and cognizant of time, I did just want to, uh, from, from my heart to yours, thank everyone. Uh, today for joining us. Uh, crazy times again. We appreciate you guys logging in and having these critical conversations. Um, thank you, panelists, for your insights on COVID 19's impact in healthcare networks. Again, An Anna Lee Ill, CISO of Involta, Eric Dahl, Vice President of Business Development, SVP, Mark McNeil, who's the lead of the healthcare practice over at Tech Guidance, and Ryan Barbera, CEO of Data Canopy. And a big thank you to our guest moderator, my colleague, my friend, Paul Stetchley, director here at JSA, for keeping us on point today. And a quick reminder, this is not the end of our conversation. We will be hopping over to uh, LinkedIn. The, uh, the link is right there in the chat box. And I'll send it to our, our panelists by email, too, uh, in, a, in a minute. Uh, but absolutely click on that link um, and join us for a continuation of this Q&A. Uh, for the remaining part of the hour over on LinkedIn. And viewers, if you were one of the very first 100 registrants, hope you enjoyed your lunch. Go ahead and visit us at jsa.net to register for upcoming JSA virtual roundtables, including our next series. Um, we we're talking COVID-19, May 28th, uh, on, and its impact on educational networks. Um, so uh, moving right along with our, our topics on how COVID-19 is impacting our industry and client protocols. So that is a wrap. Look out for the playback of today's roundtable coming soon to JSA TV and JSA podcasts on YouTube, iTunes, iHeart, Spotify, and more. Everywhere you're looking, we'll be there. Meantime, see you over on LinkedIn. Happy networking and stay safe, my friends. Mm -hmm.